Revelation 19. Hallelujah. We hear that word a lot. And it's really not even an English word. It's a Hebrew word. Psalm 113. Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rise of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations in His glory above the heavens. Who is light unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high? Who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth? Who raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people? He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be joyful and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. That's simply what it means. When we say hallelujah, it's the same as if we said praise the Lord. Both the Hebrew hallelujah and the Greek mean the same thing. Praise the Lord. It's a Hebrew transliteration. We don't really know how, what, it, what it means. In the, the legacy which John and Eric uses, it's, it's interesting because the legacy uses the word Yahweh. But if you know anything about ancient Israelites, they would not say Yahweh. They wouldn't even write out Yahweh. That's why when Yahweh is, is written in, in the ancient text, it's simply written as YH. WH, because they so revered that covenant name of God that they would not utter it and did not want to write it, lest they break the commandment of taking His name in vain. In this chapter that we're looking at, this is the only Text. This is the only chapter in the entirety of the New Testament. 27 books of the New Testament, 22 chapters in the book of the Revelation, and this is the only chapter in the entirety of the New Testament that the word hallelujah is used. And it's used four times. Verse 1, verse 3, verse 4, and verse 6. But if you look at the Septuagint, Septuagint, if you, if you ever are reading something that's of a biblical or theological nature, you come upon these letters here, LXX, that's just shorthand for Septuagint. That is the Greek translation of the Old Testament Scriptures. The Greek Septuagint uses the word hallelujah frequently as a title for certain songs. Psalm 111, verse 1, Psalm 112, verse 1, Psalm 113, verse 1, and there are others. The Psalms use that word, hallelujah, praise the Lord over and over again, for that was Israel's hymn book. That was, that was the, the Psalms that they would use to utter and to sing the praises of Yahweh. As you and I have seen repeatedly throughout this book, there's a strong connection with Israel. <clears throat> Revelation 19. And we'll read the first ten verses.
And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are His judgments. For He hath judged the great war which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. And hath avenged the blood of His servants at her hand. <clears throat> And again they said, Hallelujah. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. He saith to be right. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. As we go to the Lord in prayer, I want you to think upon those clean linens that the bride wears. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, we bow in your presence. We acknowledge <coughs> your kingship. We come to you in worship, giving you the worthship that you are owed. Lord, we thank you for the hope that you give us. Lord, we thank you that you call us to be ready always to give, a, to give an answer for the hope that is within us. And we pray, Lord, that we would take the words of this book of the Revelation that we've heard up until now and that we will hear this morning to heart. And that we would put hope on full display in our lives.
that surpasses all understanding. And what the peace that we have. For it's in the name of the Prince of Peace that we pray. Amen. J. Murray McGee points out that when we come to this 19th chapter of the book of Revelation, that a shift is made. And this chapter begins focusing on you and me. While I agree with him to an extent, I would enlarge upon that and I would say that the entirety of the book of Revelation is for you and me. The book of Revelation is not for those who will face wrath. The book of the Revelation is for those who have hope. <coughs> we do not fear what we have read thus far. We don't look with trepidation at events that are to come and crumble. But we stand on the sure foundation, on the solid rock that is Christ. As I've said already, this book up until now, and even here in this present chapter, shows solidarity, shows connection with the liturgical worship of the liturgical worship of those early churches and how they shared many traits in common with the synagogue and the temple worship of the first century. And there's a reason for that. Jesus was an Israelite. His apostles were Israelites. The earliest Christians were all Israelites. They did not abandon their Israelite heritage when they acknowledged Jesus as their Messiah. <clears throat> Rather, they understood their Israelite heritage <clears throat> in Jesus, their Messiah. You and me are called out of our Gentile heritage. And you and me are grafted into that tree which is Israel. And we become one with Israel. S.R. Hirsch talks about hallelujah this way. He says, Hallel is the song of jubilation that has accompanied our wanderings of thousands of years, keeping awake within us the consciousness of our world historical mission, strengthening us in times of sorrow and suffering, and filling our mouths with songs of rejoicing in days of deliverance and triumph. To this day, it revives on each festival season the memory of divine redemption and our confidence in future greatness. Think about what we're looking at here in this chapter. The last couple of weeks, we looked at the prostitute, Babylon. We shift now today to looking at the bride, and there couldn't be any greater in contrast. You have the prostitute and the bride on full display. The bride is, is pictured in her white, clean linens. The prostitute is pictured in her purple and scarlet clothing. Showing a, an extravagant lifestyle, whereas the bride shows a simple and pure lifestyle. prostitute. Though ancient Babylon has influenced man for thousands of years, the cup of the wrath of the Lord has finally come. And her destruction 
was seen last week. The bride has been waiting. The bride has been waiting with oil in her lamps. And the bridegroom has come. And she is ready. There's a strong relationship between Hallel, Passover, and the death of Jesus. Think about the, what, what I mentioned there in the quote by Hirsch. That Hallel brings out the very nature of the festival season. Divine redemption and future grace. When you look at the Hebrew calendar, when you look at the Jewish calendar, the Old Testament calendar of the festivals, the beginning of the Hebrew year begins with Passover, with redemption. The end of the, of, the, of the Jewish year ends with tabernacles. A time in which we focus on presence and anticipation. The children of Israel, in, in celebrating tabernacles, celebrated those that season in which they lived in tents in the desert. And it points forward to Jesus wrapping himself in flesh and tabernacling amongst us. He is present with us. But we also anticipate his second advent, his return. So the, the Israelite calendar begins with redemption and ends with anticipation, with that eager expectation of that which is to so hallelujah the Passover lamb that lamb that was brought into the home a year old without spot without blemish treated as a member of the family and then at the appointed time slain the blood placed on the doorpost and on the lintel of the house the death angel moves throughout Egypt. The Egyptian homes didn't have that blood. And the firstborn died. The Israelites' homes had the blood. And the angel passed over. Providing redemption. Sparing that family from the wrath of God. These events, Hallel, Passover, the death of Jesus, explain the use of all early church liturgies, incorporating Hallel into the worship of Easter and Easter week. It is not incidental that we celebrate the, the death, burial, and resurrection in the same season as, Jew, as Jews celebrate the Passover. For Jesus is our Passover. He is the one who gives you and me redemption. He purchased you. You were a slave to sin and death. You had the sentence of destruction on your forehead. And He purchased you with the price of His own blood. Eucharist, Christ holds intimate communion with His church, giving her light and love. Think about what we just did with these elements here. What we did with that bread and that wine is the most intimate act of worship and fellowship that we can do as a congregation. And it's not just with one another. It's not just something that we do as brothers and sisters in Christ in corporate worship. But Jesus is present with us. We are not just 
coming to the Lord's table, remembering something that happened in history, saying that there was a man named Jesus who lived in Galilee, who taught some good things, and then died. There's much more to the Lord's Supper than just what happened in the past. There's the reality that Jesus is present with us. Yes, He went away, but He sent another comforter. Another of the same time. Who teaches us, who reminds us all things whatsoever Jesus taught us when He was on this earth. And if Jesus went away, what was the promise He gave? If I go, I will come again and take you to where I am, that where I am, you may be also. In his first letter, John writes of the light and the love that we have in Christ. In Him there is light, and in Him there is love. I shared a couple weeks ago about when we took the kids to Squire Road Cabins and there's a time there toward the end of the tour when they turn out all the lights. And when you're underground and the lights go out, it's dark. You literally can't see this far. And that is a picture of what sin is. When you are in sin... You are in the darkness. And all it takes is for somebody to turn on one little bitty flashlight and it changes everything. All it takes is for someone to share the truth of God's Word. They don't, they don't have to share every word from Genesis to Revelation. All they have to do is bring out one truth and a light is lit. And it changes the entire atmosphere in that moment that God's Word is spoken. In Him is light. In Him is life. Is, is life. Light and life. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But in Christ, God raises you up. Have you experienced that resurrection today? Have you experienced the resurrection life of salvation? Have you experienced the life that comes from confessing sin, saying the same thing about your sin that God says about it, repenting of it, and surrendering to Him as King? The praise here concludes with the sounds of another great moment. The redeemed throngs. <coughs> the redeemed throngs. Just a couple things to point out. I've already said that this bride is arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, showing her purity. Showing her righteousness, which is not her own, but this is a righteousness that is imputed to her. It is Christ's righteousness imputed in her. This one of whom, hallelujah, his son is the Lord God, and he is omnipotent. He is all powerful. Think about, about who God is. Think about that, those omnis. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. There is nothing that he cannot do. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. There's nothing He doesn't know about you. Even your deepest, darkest secret is not unknown to Him. And He is omnipresent. 
he can hear Miss Myrtle's prayers wherever she is at the same time that he hears Miss Charlotte's prayers wherever she is. And he can process those prayers just like that. There in verse 10, John says, And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, See, thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren, that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Isn't it interesting that this man, John the Revelator, the Apostle John, the one who Jesus loved, the beloved disciple, records <coughs> a lapse in judgment, his own lapse in judgment. This servant of God stands before him. John falls to his feet and begins to worship him. And this servant says, hey, don't do that. Isn't it interesting that John is writing to seven churches, many of which are struggling with the whole worship of angels thing. And here in chapter 19, he records his own failure about falling at the feet of this servant and being rebuked by the servant saying, don't do that. Worship God alone. John, even though he's an apostle, even though he's saved, he's still dealing with this fleshly body. He's still dealing with the corrupt nature. And he is no different. He's showing solidarity. He's showing that he is just like he is prone to the same things that the seven churches are prone to. He's saying, look, it's easy. It's easy to take your eyes off of Jesus. John remembers when his friend Peter did that. Lord, if it's really you, Bid me to come out on the water. Okay, come on out. Peter was doing just fine until he began to look at the waves and feel the wind beating against him. And then he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And the indication isn't that Jesus picked him up and carried him back. The indication, I, I get the picture that Jesus picked him up, and the two of them walked together back to the boat. Consider how this lamb and his chaste bride are distinguished from the prostitute and her lovers of the previous chapters. The lamb and his bride are put forth as the pinnacle everything that's been said up to this point. And for all the attention that the prostitute brings to herself, for all the attention that her lovers give to her, that prostitute shifts to the side. And the lamb and his bride are lifted up. Are you part of the bride? Are you part of of the kingdom? Are you part of Israel? Can you say that you have dual citizenship? Physically, you are a citizen of the United States of America, but can you also say that you are spiritually a citizen of Israel? Part of the distinction here goes to the holy war that transpires in verses 11 to 21. And I saw heaven open. 
Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he that judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treaded the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing on the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, To all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. a contrast here? There's two suppers. There's the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then there's the supper of the battle of the earth feasting upon the wicked. Bodies that not even given the dignity of burial, but left for the mere animals to eat up. That you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them. And the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And that's all the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken with him, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that he received the mark of the beast, and then that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. This is the second coming. This is the return of Jesus. This is everything that we're waiting for. This is the promise that Jesus made to his disciples. I will not drink this cup with you again until I drink it with you in the kingdom. He is coming this time on a white horse. The first time he came, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Here he is described riding a white horse. Both the donkey and the white horse are used for, for kingly purposes. The, the donkey shows more of a statesman. The white horse shows the warrior. And Jesus comes as that warrior. Christ will keep His word to His churches. Christ will keep His word to you and me. Not one word that's been written right here is void. Not one word will be unfulfilled. Every word written right here will be fulfilled. He rules with justice. 
in this second coming, he has a sword. But notice where the sword comes from. Typically, when a soldier has a sword, he has it where? He has it in his hand. And he's ready to fight. But this here sword proceeds forth out of Jesus' mouth. Why is that? Because this sword is the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword able to divide between bone and marrow. The Word of God cuts to the heart of you and me. The Word of God exposes the intentions and the motives of your heart. The Word of God places your sin on full display. And you must deal with it. Previously, the question was raised, who can make war with the beast? You know what the answer is? Jesus alone. The, the earth dwellers, those who followed after the beast, those who were so enamored by the beast, those who saw the beast as powerful, those who worshipped the beast, lifted him up and said, Who can make war against him? And we say, Jesus alone. And make war against the beast. Here's something interesting. He has a name. Jesus has a name. It's not known. known that power is shared with those to whom it is disclosed. Jesus' name is not made known to everyone. Jesus' name is made known to those who are His. When He comes that second time and He judges the earth dwellers, it is said that His name is not known by those earth dwellers. But when a name is made known, then power is shared. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again to receive you to Myself. To you, His name is made known. You know Him as the Word of God. You know Him as the King of Kings. You know Him as the Lord of Lords. Don't you? Do you know Him as the Word of God? Do you know Him as the King of Kings? Do you know Him as the Lord of Lords? Have you acknowledged Him? He's already the Word of God. He's already the King of Kings. He's already the Lord, the Lord of Lords. But have you acknowledged Him? Have you come face to face with your own sin? And have you bowed your heart and your knee to Him? Have you given your life to Him? Scripture says in verse 13, His robe is dipped in blood. Whose blood is this? He's coming to make war. And He's making a great supper for those fowls of the air. Is His blood dipped? 
blood of those earth dwellers who face their final tragedy? <clears throat> Alan F. Johnson asked, is the blood that road red from his enemy's blood or from his own blood? He then asked, if the blood is his enemies, how is it that Christ comes from heaven with his robe already dipped in blood before any battle is mentioned? He asserts the blood that is always mentioned is in connection with Christ and the apocalypse and his own lifeblood. What do we know about Jesus? He is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. He is the Lamb that was slain at Calvary. When He comes that second time, His blood, His, His robe is already dipped in blood. It's not of His enemy's blood. It's of His own blood. The battle's already won. The battle was won at Calvary. At Calvary, His robe was dipped in His own blood. It was spilt for you and for me. Receive His blood today. Receive the atonement that His blood offers today. Call upon Him as Lord today. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank You for Your blood dipped, Your blood drenched, Your blood soaked robe. Lord, in the garden it would have been easy. You get a strike out of it. That you chose to kill an animal. To shed the blood of an animal. And to clothe Adam with the skins of that animal. Pointing forward to your own blood being spilt at Calvary. Pointing forward to us being clothed in your righteousness. Lord, I pray that if anyone today, whether here in person or anyone who might hear this message on the website later, does not know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of your salvation. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.